This is The Cracking of the Ivory Tower of General Relativity by Kelly Hansen. That's me. Impressive mathematics, but unrealistic physical interpretation. That was the reaction that circulated among scientists in response to Einstein's general theory of relativity, published in 1915. In fact, few scientists could manipulate the mathematics, and there was widespread suspicion about a theory that was both highly abstract and made sweeping claims that gravity was merely a property of space. After an initial explosion of interest, general relativity's highly abstract and mathematical nature led it into a period of stagnation that spanned decades. It picked up the reputation of being the mathematician science, a subfield with very little relevance to physics. In this sense, general relativity is claimed to have developed in an ivory tower, one where relativists live out their lives pursuing science sheltered from the requests of society. Of all physicists, the general relativist has the least social commitment. He is the great specialist in, general, in gravitational theory, but he is not consulted in the building of a tower, a bridge, a ship, of an aeroplane, and even the astronauts can do without him. Let the relativist rejoice in the ivory tower where he has peace to seek understanding of Einstein's theory as long as the busy world is satisfied to do its jobs without him. That was from um, Jean Eisenstadt's The Low Water Mark of General Relativity. General Relativity's lack of relevance manifested in low attendance at conferences, a scarcity of published papers, and the utter lack of graduate classes. However, these symptoms of Relativity's unpopularity have disappeared altogether. In fact, one might say that General Relativity has become one of the most popular fields in physics today. How did rel General Relativity undergo such a drastic change as it developed throughout the mid to late 1900s? Due to the fact that the observable effects were not as obvious as other more popular subfields, such as quantum mechanics, it would require much larger institutional forces. Due to this necessity of relying on the larger powers of society, we see that it was impossible for relativists to remain locked in their ivory tower during this period of rapid growth and change. The first instance of general relativity's reliance on society comes during the strenuous period of World War I. At the time, general relativity's sole piece of physical evidence was the precession of Mercury's orbit, and this lack of physical evidence turned many scientists away from the field, but not all. Perhaps the most outspoken advocate for relativity at the time was Arthur Eddington, plumium professor at Cambridge. While the war raged, he led an expedition to take images of a solar eclipse in order to show that the positions of stars near the sun appear to shift due to the paths of their light bending around the sun's gravity. Eddington was motivated by his faith. As Quakers are inherently pro-peace, the Eclipse expedition was Eddington's attempt to rise above war and restore some sense of trust to the German scientific communi community, akin to other Quakers' humanitarian efforts during World War I. Spanning months of planning and execution under the support of the Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society, or RAS, the expedition was a massive undertaking. For scientists living in Europe, the eclipse's location spanning from Africa towards South America was very inconvenient, and equipment needed to be bought and properly modified to best suit the state of the mission. As it was the middle of World War I, it proved quite difficult to obtain the necessary resources, clearance, and manpower from the British government. Even Eddington himself was forbidden to go on the expedition until his collaborator Frank Watson Dyson, a member of the RAS, managed to use his connections to obtain him an exception. Despite the challenges, the expedition was successful, and Eddington would prove Einstein's theory correct. He also accomplished his own personal goal of international connection. Headlines covering the fantastic result were displayed in newspapers around the globe. In America, the New York Times bore the now famous quote, lights all askew in the heavens. It was only worthy for such a large undertaking to be shown in such international spotlight, and thus, we see general relativity's not-so-humble beginnings on the international stage. Despite the big splash into international stardom, general relativity would require more to sever it completely from its ivory tower reputation. It needed a little boost. In a world still shaken with Germanophobia, relativity would need a stronger link with society to progress more. In an industrializing post-World War I world, we meet physicist Bryce DeWitt winner of the Gravity Research Foundation Essay Contest in 1953. 
After winning the essay contest, DeWitt was approached by Agnew Bonson, a man with a wild imagination and very deep pockets. Bonson, like several others in that time period, was very interested in the concept of anti-gravity. Those of that time believed that the discovery of some kind of anti-gravitational paint or contraption would lead to massive change in the economy, transportation, and warfare, and thus they pressed for, an for gravity research in hopes of making such a discovery. This interest in anti-gravity anti technology was influenced by a cultural period called the Golden Age of Science Fiction, which began in the late 1930s and extended into the 1950s. Yet, this cultural aspect was able to influence rich players such as Bonson, who convinced DeWitt to head the Institute of Field Physics at the University of North Carolina, of which he garnered most of the funding for through raising, uh, fundraising events he personally attended. Though Bonson provided the monetary means for the Institute's existence, credit for its contributions to general relativity should really be given to DeWitt and the other scientists collaborating with him. It was certainly not easy to ensure the Institute's work and purpose remained solely on general relativity, as Bonson was very persistent in painting his picture of anti-gravity technology onto it. Despite the distractions, the Institute was quite successful in helping spur general interest in development in general relativity. In 1957, it hosted a conference which became the first in a series of international conferences on the subject of general relativity. And the first also to show a definitive theoretical demonstration that gravitational radiation is a robust feature of the general theory of relativity. As such, we can see that, spurred by the cultural expansion of science fiction, general relativity intertwines itself more deeply with society and thus reaps the benefits. As the 50s fade into the 60s, we see a change in the mindset of funding for science. In the 1960s, it was common for the military to fund science and would remain so until the passing of the Mansfield's uh, Amendment in 1969, which required military-funded science research to have a direct relationship to military function, sadly enough. In this military-driven time, a new player comes into view, Erwin Shapiro. Shapiro was recruited to Lincoln Laboratories, a military-funded lab run by MIT, onto their radar team. Though he originally worked on missile tracking technology, Shapiro ran into a peculiar prediction of general relativity that piqued his mind. Gravity slows down light. Due to his experience with radar, Shapiro began to wonder if radar could be used to prove this prediction. At that time, it would not have been possible. The relativistic effects were too small. This fact was what had held back general relativity for so many decades, pushing away scientists who subsequently deemed it unnecessary. However, as Shapiro himself said, everything changed abruptly in the fall of 1964. That year, Haystack, America's most sensitive radar facility, was completed, and Shapiro determined that using Haystack, his experiment to test general relativity, famously called Shapiro time delay, could be successful. Ultimately, it would not be that easy. The Haystack facility itself required costly upgrades and the analysis needed precise measurements of the planets, which was a uh, time-consuming process. Luckily, technology would not stand in the way this time. General relativity now had society on its side. At the last minute, the Air Force provided the monetary means necessary and the project was green to go. Despite large uncertainties in the data, the experiment was successful. Advances in technology and support from the government had allowed Shapiro to advance general relativity, a phenomenon which would continue to show itself decades into the future. Even as recently as 2015, with the detection of gravitational waves from LIGO, we see that advances in society technologically give us increasingly more accurate vision into a universe dominated by general relativity. As we can see, the 1900s were filled with shifting opinions about science. There were th those like Eddington, who used science as a means of soothing international relations, those like DeWitt, who profited off um, a growing science pop culture obsession, <laughs> and those like Shapiro, who showed that technological advances could bring about new science previously thought impossible. Science has become more intertwined with society as the experiments get bigger and the ideas get more complex. As the science with the biggest experiments and the most complex ideas of the time, General relativity was in no way excluded from these societal changes. Instead, it has shown us that, if anything, science requires more input and interaction with society in order to progress. Experiments are only going to get physically bigger and more sensitive, 
and the options for funding to build the necessary technology grow slimmer as the costs rise. Ironically, science also continues to become more and more abstract. One need only look to string theory, a branch of physics that as of currently has no observable physical predictions. <laughs> However, we see that these things only appear non-applicable on the surface. One need only look at a GPS system or the military's quasar-based celestial reference frames to see how deeply general relativity has infiltrated our practical lives. General relativity was only the beginning of a journey to discover humanity's place among the stars. And if we wish to continue that journey, there needs to be a further shift towards the active collaboration of science and society. No longer can we continue to hold similar views of modern science as those in the past did of general relativity. Society must learn to appreciate the fact that our ability to look out and wonder about the universe is the most inherently human trait about us and to encourage the science that enables that. Thanks for listening.